Um, August McKenna asks a very personal question, which I love. What meal could you make at home tonight without any shopping? Well, so I'm going to reveal about us in my house, which is that um, we, we take our cooking pretty seriously in my house. And we, are, we, have, a well, we have a well and deeply stocked larder. Um, yeah, my wife, my partner, Julia, uh, is a very gifted cook. Uh, and like always grew up, she grew up in a cooking family. Her mom's a wonderful cook, relatives, all sorts of cooks. There are literally cookbooks given amongst her family as gifts, right? Like it goes deep. Um, but seriously, over COVID, we just, we did, we did so much cooking at home over COVID. Like her time management shifted on axis and like uh, she cooks beautiful things and always trying new things. Uh, and we... We are not kitchen gadget people, but we love our kitchen to be well stocked. Uh, a few, a, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, a chef friend called me and said, "Hey, I'm doing a demo at Liho Liho uh, near your house, and I wanted to know if I could come and borrow a two inch cookie round." And I was like, "Absolutely!" And she said something along the lines of you have the best outfitted kitchen of my friends. And I was all like, <laughs> I'm so happy for that compliment. Um, so when I say like, it's not that we're a kitchen gadget shop because it's not like we've got like a bread maker and stuff like that. And I don't decry those things. I just like, we are all about having a full complement of like, scientific sieves for sieving soups and dressings and things. And we've got several different sizes of stock pots. And we're lucky enough to have bought a house with a faucet right on the stove so that we can fill our pasta water there. Uh, what else do we make sure we have tons of? Yeah, we've, so I could make a lot of things at home tonight. We could make a lot of things tonight at home. Um, I am not, I'm not gonna say I'm not good at cooking because I am good at cooking but I am not gifted in the way that my wife and my son are. Thing one is actually a, a, a cook at a Michelin star restaurant. Um, and my wife and my son both have like, like a deep, like a real point of view about food. The, everything creative to me redounds to having a point of view, to having a, I have an, a specific opinion on right and wrong in this regard. Uh, and when it comes to food, I like, I'm really good at, my palate's good, it's sensitive, I'm good at finishing. So if you give me your soup, I, I can figure out what kind of salts and vinegars and other things it might need to like get it to really pop. I, that is something I am good at. But when it comes to like coming up with a meal, I tend to throw everything into everything and I tend to go overboard with it. Um, so my specialty is eggs. I cook omelets and scrambled eggs. I make a slow cooked scramble that we've covered on the channel. And if we break this video out, we'll include a link to my omelet cook off with Tracy Desjardins in my kitchen. You can see my kitchen in action. Um, and recently on The Bear, there is an, if you're not watching The Bear, you should totally watch The Bear. It's on Hulu and there are two seasons of it, and it's one of my favorite shows. I found the first episode so stressful, I did not go back to watch the second episode for several months. But when I did, I was highly rewarded. And the second season is a weirdly amazing thing in that it's fundamentally a different sort of kind of show than the first season. It feels very different dramatically. And in the second season, there's an episode called The Omelet, in which the amazing chef Sydney makes an omelet for sugar, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. And she does something that I had never seen before, which is she takes the eggs and cracks them into a, uh, a wire colander, a sieve, and she beats the eggs until they have gone through the sieve. And then she uses those eggs for the omelet. And I'm like, what the? And then I look it up and there's all these articles online about Chef Sid's omelet and how sieving your eggs, when you, beating your eggs through a sieve is how you get that super smooth French omelet thing. And it's the first time I realized why you fold an omelet two ways. Like I've been doing the classic American half moon flip forever. I don't do a pan flip. I don't know how to do that. That is like tight rope walking to me. Um, but 
when you have made your eggs really, really smooth, you want that texture to come out. And when you do the half moon, when you do the half moon omelet, you end up with this texture difference in which this is really smooth, but this gets a little bit uh, heartier because it's thinner and it's cooking a little more. Uh, doing the trifold like the French omelet actually solves that problem. Uh, and I do make omelets for dinner about once a month. We feel like something light and easy. Um, since you've asked about cooking, I'm just gonna tell, I have a new favorite melter cheese. Don't get me wrong, Gruyere is still, I think the king of all melters, but you don't need a lot, right? It's a really specific taste. But we have come across these things called uh, Alpine cheeses, uh, Atoma and Atome, uh, and they're both really gentle, mild melters that are really, really good cheeses. So we could cook a lot of things. We could bake even tonight. Uh, like that's how reasonably stocked we are. Our entire freezer door is nothing but flours and grains for cooking. Yeah, so lots of things. We could cook lots of things. I am so sorry. I'm going to back and I'm going to go back and add one more thing to my discussion about omelets. Chef Sydney's omelet was not just her whisking through the sieve. She also then, with the omelet on the pan, uh, used a cake bag to squeeze out some Boursin cheese. Holy cow! Uh, Boursin is like the Bushmills Scotch of cheeses. Like you should always have it in your house. It's perfectly inoffensive and also turns out to be actually delicious. Uh, and I've tried Sydney's omelet. I did not try it with the crackled ruffles on top because I'm a monster, but I will. Um, okay, Kyle Bettinger asks, what is one craft you have little to no experience with that you would love to dive into? Oh, that is easy because it is sitting in a bin in storage waiting for me to show it some love. Stained glass. Uh, I was aware and delighted when uh, Tested Zone Simone Yatch recently built a robotic arm out of stained glass which is not something that anyone was needing. And that is exactly why I love that project. Uh, and actually earlier this year, Simone and I were catching up on FaceTime and she was actually sitting there doing some of the work on that video, like clipping glass for stained glass. And it just looked very accessible. And then it turns out that uh, Kate Sabaker, who just did a bunch of wonderful work with us on, on Bethesda, uh, is a stained glass uh, expert. And so that will, I bought, I bought lots of glass. I got the copper tape. I got some smoothers. I got the soldering irons. I got all the stuff getting ready because I have a specific lampshade I want to make out of stained glass. And it's, it's space based and it's Apollo based. Uh, I have the design already in my head. It's just been about like getting up the energy to bring that over and start from scratch in front of the camera. But yeah. That's definitely one. And there's lots of others. Um, I have a planishing hammer and an English wheel upstairs in my loft that I'd love to bring down. I am totally inexperienced in using those tools. Uh, but back when I was making TV money, I bought one of each, so I had them in my collection. Mm. One of the key ways I want to expand my shop specifically is to add more armor making tools. Ah, and in that regard, Phil Redbeard had a second question. You're getting two questions today, Phil. Uh, has visiting the conservation lab at the Met made you rethink how you approach caring for or restoring old tools and items you purchase on eBay and other marketplaces? Yes, it has. Now, Phil Redbeard is talking about the fact that we have now twice gone, twice, yeah? To the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the venerable the, the, the legendary, uh, and we have specifically, uh, well, actually we've done three sets of videos there because the first one was walking through their beautiful exhibit of the last night about the Emperor Maximilian, the last emperor to go into battle in full armor and the Met did an amazing exhibition. And actually to go all the way back to origin stories, when I first saw Excalibur by John Borman when I was 14, uh, my dad was like, if you like armor, let me show you something. And he took me into New York City, which was always a treat as a middle teenager to go to the city with your dad. And he took me to the Met and we walked into the armor room and I saw those knights on horseback and my life was never the same, seriously. Uh, so it was wonderful to go back to the Met and walk through the, the, the last night exhibition 
And by the way, there's an amazing companion book for that exhibit, uh, which if you're interested in armor, you should own. Uh, and then we've gone back to the conservation lab and we've covered gauntlets and swords and uh, links in the description. Um, it's a set of some of my favorite things we've done on Tested. And yeah, it really has shifted how I think about caring for and restoring old tools and items that I purchase. Um, the main thing that I have learned is that there's not much of a mystery to conservation. It is really pretty straightforward. When you hear about museum conservators doing their thing and you see all those shots of them working one millimeter at a time, it seems like it is this um, highly esoteric craft, which in a way it is. But it's not like they're using all sorts of super exotic materials. It's like much of their work happens with filtered, deionized water uh, and really, really gentle compounds for removing dirt. And the philosophy of conservation has changed over the years. And the current philosophy is not to like restore it back to some other state, but to cease the deterioration from this moment forward. And if other previous conservation efforts have led to a false surface, maybe restoring that or simply describing this is why it looks weird. Um, the lack of the mystery has been really lovely. Uh, when I built the, 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 the case for Newton's death mask for the Royal Society, that en uh, engendered a lot of research into conservation and to archival materials. And again, it's not that mysterious or esoteric. The materials are really straightforward. Stable foams and plastics that don't off-gas or metals like aluminum. Uh, glues that are also archival, so not acid-based glues. You know, these are, these are known quantities. Um, and it has made me, uh, it's given me a great perspective on... In one sense, in one sense, I have always considered myself the steward of these objects. I am in charge of them for a while. I don't really think of, I, I really truly don't think of myself as owning this stuff. I'm gonna die someday. We're all going, we're all leaving with a to-do list. And I, I, don't, I don't want people to be saddled with this stuff when I go. I want it to go to some place that is an, uh, an embiggening, an elaborate, uh, an expansion. Um, like gold to airy thinness beat, right? I want this collection to do good out in the world. So occasionally people come in here and someone will lose their mind over a specific object and I will realize that they love it way more than I ever will and I will give it to them to take away with them. That is part of like, I am very much the steward of these objects. Uh, and so, yeah. Talking to uh, Ted and Sean and Philip and the other wonderful people at the at the Mets Conservation Lab uh, has been a great education in deepening my feelings of stewardship for the collection. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are, of course, below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects. Questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams and we have some members only videos, including the Adam real time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.